Okay, uh, so we want to make sure we have enough time for discussion and also to do our exercise. So uh, I'm going to try to save uh, the use cases to be a little bit shorter since uh, our few break, a few break went through. So uh, we're going to go through four different use cases. Uh, first, uh, personalized feedback, because I know most of us are very interested in adaptive learning. Right. Uh, secondly, we're going to talk about Alex is going to help us go through group dynamics uh, and look at network structures when you have a discussion forum with many students involved. How can we understand the roles that students play in this? Uh, and then also when you have a learning system like SLS, sometimes you don't get to see the students. They may be at home or other places uh, but learn using the system. How do you know whether they're actually doing what they're supposed to do? Okay, so we want to uh, understand the, uh, whether they're disengaged or not. Let me try to get rid of this notification. It's been bouncing up and down for the whole time. Uh, and then finally, a little bit on uh, not emotional learning analytics, but uh, textual analytics. Because uh, using text, we can also understand emotion through sentiment, right? So uh, students express themselves through text, and how do we understand that? So uh, we already know some things about text, right? So uh, when we think about learning analytics and trying to provide personalized feedback, we know that if we want to do it at scale, all the learners in the cohort, uh, <coughs> the way of doing that is quite uneven, right? It depends on the instructor, it depends on uh, the, the space that's allowed, okay? And we already know our, our teachers are under a lot of time pressure, right? They have no time for learning analytics because it's just going to eat into their schedule. Right? They want to be able to spend the time interacting with the students, right? Not, you know, paying attention to reports and other things that they have to write or read, okay? So how do we get it to the point where it's a benefit to them rather than, a, you know, a, a, another encumbrance that we are enforcing on teachers, right? So we need to be able to provide the tools that enable instructors to actually do this at a reasonable scale and for the uh, instructors to get useful feedback back to them. So what we really want to do is think about uh, involving things in a cyclical process. So Abelardo already mentioned the LA cycle, right, where you're thinking about designing, thinking about the specific research question that you want answered and driving the analytics through this. But let's think about a shorter time scale. Perhaps within a, a term, you might have SA as well as HA, or maybe you know, on a weekly basis, you have some assessments, okay? Maybe we want to make sure that uh, in this short cycle, something can be done, okay? So for an activity, we can think about the activity having some types of assessments and uh, messages associated with those assessments, okay? Uh, for different levels of interaction. For example, when a, a, a video is presented, whether they watch the whole thing or part of it, or when there's MCQs offered online, whether they master it or they have certain difficulties with this, okay? And uh, after you've designed the messages, we're going to let machine learning do the work of selecting the appropriate message. So we're not gonna go over exactly how that's done at this point, but let's just assume that uh, maybe we look at some particular uh, levels of interaction, okay? And that uh, using analytics, we can decide which of the messages that we want to give to the students, okay? These messages are then collated over many various activities within that cycle, and then a personalized message can be sent to the student. Now, I think I want to emphasize that it's very important that the students feel like it is personalized, because otherwise what happens is the system sends out the message, everyone gets the same generic message, and they switch off, right? So we already know we get lots of automated emails, you know, and our new uh, younger millennial and digital generations even more switched off to that. Right? They can tell right away when you're sending a real email and when you're sending them, you know, some, you know, bullet points, right? Okay. So definitely, I think it's very important that we involve the teachers in this. You know, they have to have oversight to the personalized email that's going to be sent. But they have that uh, ability to customize it and save the time for the teacher. If the teacher were to do this or the particular uh, designer were to do this, it would take just too much time. Okay. So we summarize it for them, we let them do the sending, we let them interact with the students, because this is what they're there for, right? To interact with our students, okay? So uh, for example, what we might want to do is offer a video, 
or a set of videos, right, or a set of MCQs. And what we would want to do is decide whether a student is engaged or not. So the very simple metrics are looking at the times that they have watched or the amount of time, right? Because some students, they may watch it, uh, they may switch uh, to other things or uh, just click on it to say, yeah, I've done it, uh, but they haven't really engaged on it, okay? And then simply uh, for uh, sequences of exercises or MCQs, we might look at a, a, a formative or summative assessment and see how many uh, they got right or wrong, okay? And uh, we're going to look at a case uh, that Abelardo mentioned in his paper. This is a section based on his work with quartiles. So we're splitting the cohort up into four quadrants and deciding what to do with that. Okay. So this is a, a particular case where we have engagement with a, a sequence of summative uh, exercises. So maybe they have uh, a very large number of incorrect answers here, right? That we are trying to create a, a template for a personalized message. Again, I want to emphasize that the personalization has to come from the teacher, right? They need to make it work for that particular student, okay? And uh, so you can see the, the different things that are involved here. The key point about this is this can be done way in advance, okay? So we prepare the unit, we prepare the exercise, along with the activity, we already craft out the messages that we want to send, okay? But instead of the instructor or the curriculum designer actually doing all the work during the process, we let the algorithm take over, right? The algorithm is going to structure all these messages, send them to the teacher or send them into SLS, okay? Then the SLS can decide, okay, am I actually going to send these messages? Maybe sometimes no, maybe sometimes yes, okay? And then uh, actually execute this. Any questions so far? Pretty simple, right? So this is a, a, a how, how we do it. So based on a number of different activities, we can compile several messages together, right? So it would be a customized email that would be aggregated over all of the components, and then we could send it out on a regular basis. So the student, as you saw earlier, when we saw the activity connected directly to the learner, we are enabling the learner to do something about what is being captured, right? Very important because otherwise we are capturing data, the student doesn't see any relevance to it, right? So this is saying immediately I can react on what's happening uh, on my session. I know how I'm doing. And instead of a complicated dashboard or anything, we give them a call to action, okay? Because sometimes analytics is too overwhelming for students. We don't want to see a dashboard. We just want to know how can I improve my learning, right? How can I engage better, right? As a parent of a, a, a P3 boy, I also have this struggle, okay? Well, unfortunately, my P3 boy has to go under assessment, right? He's like, not at the age where he, he doesn't get that, right? So all this is very important to make sure that we can save the time for the learner or the stakeholder, either the teacher or the parent involved, okay? So uh, I wanted to turn to another part where it's more adaptive. So we saw this first exercise where we're trying to scale the system, where we're trying to in advance compose messages, okay? After we've composed those messages, we have sent out these emails on a, a weekly or cyclical cycle, all right? So that system works quite well in dealing with regular repeated patterns. Students get used to this, they know what to do, okay? But if we want to personalize it, What's the limit, okay? So we wanna ask ourselves that. So here's a case of a case study where we're thinking about helping peers help themselves, okay? Now, many times as a math instructor, we may say, okay, I know as a math expert or curriculum designer, what is the right proper explanation to give, okay? What's the model way to do it? But actually, our students are better informed by their peers once in a while, right? Because we use language that's suited for adults, but especially in primary school, they may have a different way of communicating that, you know, we have such a large generational gap, we may not be able to communicate it effectively, right? We all know that peer learning helps a lot in certain circumstances, but of course there are caveats, right? We don't want the peers that didn't get the message teaching our students, <laughs> right? Because that wouldn't work. So we, uh, in this paper, what we're gonna cover is looking at how to figure out which is the right peer explanation to give, okay? 
So what we're going to do is uh, look at this where we have an uh, explanation that's given by a curriculum designer. Okay, and the usual way we can think about it is some type of A-B testing, which is like I give you several different explanations, okay, at the bottom, A, B, and N, okay, all the way to N. So this might be explanation A, and I'm just going to try them out. I'm going to give it to different uh, learners. I'm going to ask them to rate how effective they are, okay? But these are all from the point of this, uh, from a curriculum designer's point of view, okay? So we can try to use big data and say, okay, which of these ratings was better, okay, then I'm going to try to feel that more. Okay? What we are going to do instead is add another box. We're going to ask our students, can you reflect? Tell us why this answer is correct, right? Not just say, was it good or bad, but in your own words, tell us why this answer is correct, okay? And what we want to do with this is analyze and dynamically adapt to this. So for example, uh, at the first case, we may say, uh, we're going to use the explanation provided by the curriculum designer. This is condition A. Maybe it's 100% of the students are going to see this. But over time, we're going to feel more of the peers' explanations of why this answer is correct. Okay? And then gauge whether those are actually helpful for you. <coughs> okay? So Linda is training for a marathon, which is a race that's 26 miles long. This is obviously from the British system. Okay, what was Lena's running speed for the marathon in miles per minute? I can't do this this early in the morning, but uh, my <laughs> son can, okay? But uh, let's say he gets the right answer, okay. There's the explanation given by the system, all right? Now, this might be explanation A, B, or C, okay? Any one of these, all right? And then put over here. But then I'm gonna ask, you know, how helpful was this information for your learning, right? And then based on that, I'm going to be able to refine which explanations I want to show, okay? But in tandem, like I said, I'm going to ask the student to reflect on their own why this answer is right, you know? Not necessarily using the same language as in the explanation, okay? So for example, here I already have two explanations. I fielded explanation A. I let the learner decide how they feel about this question, how they understand and re reify their understanding of this concept. They write it as explanation C. The system now has another explanation, right? So I'm not gonna talk about the technical terminology here, all right? Uh, you can look it up if you'd like. Okay, or we can have a further dialogue about how this is done. Okay, this is very similar to the adaptive learning systems that you're going to hear more about. Okay, but the simple idea is this, right? So at the beginning, when I first start this type of exploration, okay, I have only one explanation. 100% of the learners are given that explanation, right? Okay, but over time, I can accumulate more. So for example, I get a second explanation, B. Okay, then I don't know which explanation is any good. So what am I gonna do? I try both of them out, okay? So we affect our learners as an experiment. We ask them which one was better. And based on what they said for this question, we can know which one was better, okay? Sorry, then what does this mean? I can refine, right? I can say, okay, um, well, B looks like it's slightly better, it's rated higher. So I'm going to expose more learners to be, okay? Why don't I cut off explanation A since it was no good? Can anyone tell me? Why, why do I still send 20% to that condition? Okay, this is exactly what is done online when you go click on things on Google or Facebook or wherever. They're doing all these types of things too. We just want to use the same technology to help us make better use of our peer explanations. All right? The reason why is we're not 100% sure that that explanation is no good. Okay? Maybe later on we can figure out a way to use that explanation well. Let me give you an example. We have high achievers and challenge students in our class, right? Do we think, really think, that the same explanation is good for everyone? Certainly not, 
right? But data can help you. Maybe the 20% that needs explanation A are the challenged ones, okay? And using data analytics, learning analytics, we can find that picture. Again, we need to have that hypothesis in mind at the beginning in order for this to happen, right? So otherwise, we would definitely do this. We'd send 100% to B, right? Why bottle of A is garbage? But we don't know that, not for certain, okay? So what we're doing here is trying to exploit, right? You're saying we know there's a better answer for most of the cohort, okay? So we want most of our students to benefit from that teaching, right? We're going to expose more of the cohort to that explanation, but we're not going to leave out the other explanation. We're still going to continually assess whether that explanation was any good, okay? Because there might be some sub-communities, some populations where that is more helpful, okay? And when we go to round four, now we have the student's explanation, explanation C. I also don't know how well it goes, so I'm going to expose a small percentage of the cohort to that, right? And then if it gets good ratings, I'm going to expose it more, okay? So there's a, a, a principled way of doing this. It's called Thompson sampling up here. But the whole idea is that we want to take a look at this balance between exploration and exploitation. Exploitation means affecting the best outcomes for learning. Okay? So this is an ongoing dynamic experiment because the learners are going to be approached different ways through different cohorts, through different cycles, maybe the same exercise, different explanations will be raised. Okay? But it is a continually improving process and it's adaptive, meaning directly, maybe five years ago, an analogy of certain type would work, but now things have changed. There's a new celebrity in town. Okay, we want to use that celebrity. Uh, you know, it's no longer Mr. Brown or whatever. Okay, then I need to adapt my uh, uh, analogy, right? So I use the learner's explanation for it, right? I don't have to do anything like that. <coughs> okay? So over time, as it stabilizes, it'll look like this, right? There might be many, 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 many different explanations of which right now, G, you know, the learner's explanation from there seems to work the best. Okay, and then I can show this the most, okay? But I'm always continually doing experimentation to see whether the right thing happens. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you a quick question. Do you think the strategy is as effective as the instructor's strategy or worse or better? Okay, this is an interactive session, right? So I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands. Do you think it was better? The same as the instructor's? or worse than the instructors. Okay, you guys are not participating. <laughs> I have to do my duty as a lecturer. <laughs> okay, so I'll tell you, all right, since this is the first interactive exercise, I'll give you the answer. It was proven to be better than the instructor's answer. And this is because, again, for certain explanations, peers have a much better way of communicating with their own, right? And some of the instructors were actually very impressed that they made certain analogies that they would not think of themselves. Okay? So this is where we turn the learning over to the peers and we use that LA, okay, the learning analytics, to scaffold, right? Not supplant. The learners are doing the learning. They're telling themselves. We're just helping to feed out, weed out the explanations that aren't so strong. Okay, that's all. All right. But I think this is a very powerful model of adapting dynamically to your explanation, right? Because sometimes as curriculum designers, it takes a long time to get through this entire cycle. You saw the cycle that Abelardo Clark painted. It's not in you know, a weekly cycle, right? You've got to be kidding. It's got to be months or years, right? But for this to occur, once we've engineered the software, it can be automatic, right? And the teacher or the curriculum constructor can go in and say, look at the report. Oh, wow, I didn't know this explanation was here. It seems like it's good, and I agree, uh, as an expert, that that is a correct way of uh, modeling uh, that scenario, okay? So, um, turning to a local spotlight, so that was a work uh, previously done uh, at University of Toronto by our associate team, uh, Joseph J. Williams, 
And so locally, you probably uh, known this person. His name is Ben Liang. Uh, he also worked at, at MOE uh, HQ for a while. Where he developed his own manage, uh, learning management system. It's called Coursemology. So I'm going to sh uh, show it to you. So this is my course that I'm currently running at NUS. Uh, this is our machine learning course. So maybe some of you want to hire the students from NUS to help you on your uh, you know, statistical expertise later. But basically what he's done is he's uh, started to gather all the data that uh, we could assemble on uh, learning, okay? But he has not done it with a particular research question in mind. His operational goal is to gamify the learning process, right? Because we know that people are excited by games, they like levels, they like leveling up. So he structured the entire learning experience like this. You can see that there are trophies for mastering a certain concept and that uh, there are analytics or leaderboards for this. So you can see on the right-hand side that uh, certain uh, sectional uh, groups for a particular TA have been featured, okay? And how well those students are doing. And then uh, for the student statistics, I can see which components they've done, how many uh, videos they've watched, and how much of the videos that they've seen. Okay, just like in the previous part where I talked about how to decide the engagement of a particular learner on the concept. Okay, so uh, this system is interesting because it's gamification for students, but also staff members. Okay, so we have a large cohort of undergraduate research assistants that are helping out with the course. So they are also gamified in the sense that when a student makes a comment on a video or uh, makes a submission to the exercise, it starts the time ticking. Maybe you've been to McDonald's or any of the fast food restaurants where they have a clock for each order that tells you how long you've done to, take, to do something. So the TAs also have this incentive to collect points by uh, doing the assessment uh, appropriately and timely. Because one of the most difficult things that we find is getting timely assessments back to the students, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over uh, <coughs> now to Alex, who's going to go through the second use case. Thanks. Uh, well, I, uh, uh, just uh, a few words on this uh, question. Uh, as uh, I mean, say, uh, with uh, learning uh, educational research, we can see that Peer learning is actually very effective. It can uh, improve uh, the way things are explained and understood by uh, other uh, students. And uh, thanks to uh, learning analytics, we can also look uh, further into that and see how uh, students are related to each other and what kind of interactions they have. Especially using a learning management system, uh, we can indeed uh, track and uh, log these kind of interactions and have an insight of their relation and the network that they are uh, making. So we can analyze this uh, with the overarching goal to improve the way we design learning and learning activities, detect learners who are facing uh, difficulties, and also try to decrease the attrition rate and keep students uh, involved in the, in the courses. So if we look at uh, network analysis, uh, we can imagine the uh, different students as a network based on the relations they have on online forums, for instance, or more uh, generally if they are involved in the same classes, in the same modules, and we can uh, draw a network map of their relations. So each student will be a node in such a network. And uh, the idea is to look at their position and to find who are the more important students who are those who are more engaged, who are those who play a role between other students or those who are actually isolated. So we can look at different kind of importance. Importance can say different things. And we can look at uh, different kind of approaches of such an importance in the network and the centrality of the network. The degree centrality is the first way to conceive this centrality. That is actually here, uh, Jill. Uh, the students in red, and uh, that will be considered the central one based on this approach of counting uh, our direct relation with other nodes, with other students in the network. But other students can be also important. For instance, Liz here, 
as you can see, uh, play has less direct connections, but we can consider her as important uh, anyway. Why would it be? Sorry? She links with the two students. Why? Yes, indeed. She links between the two students on the right and the other students on the left. So she's a kind of bottleneck, a gatekeeper between these two groups of students. She has maybe less direct relations, but she is uh, actually the one that uh, we need to go through in order to exchange between these two groups. And that makes her also very important in such a network. So here you have a uh, short definition of such uh, centralities. The first one being the number of direct neighbors. This is the first kind of importance that we tend to think of. And the second one being actually the frequency of node placement uh, or the shortest path between the different actors in the network. We could also consider closeness, that is actually the shortest distance uh, between other nodes. Or, for instance, an eigenvector, which is actually uh, the relation with influential nodes, because that will make a difference as well if you are connected with a lot of students who don't know anything about the course, or, for instance, uh, if you are connected with, with those who actually know and can explain and take the time to explain. So, why does it matter? Well, that could help us to understand how people learn and how other students can help uh, each other. So, of course, the first one of degree centrality uh, makes people obviously influence in the network. They are connected to a lot of people. So, this is a typical kind of uh, importance, popularity among students. But as we saw, betweenness can also be considered as very important because this is a necessary path to other students. This is typically in social network analysis, the kind of brokers, uh, influencers uh, that we think of. Closeness uh, may be interesting to see what is actually the fastest <coughs> point of diffusion, the way to spread information quickly between people or between students. And eigenvector, as we mentioned, will be actually important to uh, stress on the influential one. And uh, this is not what you know, but who you know uh, will make a difference. So how can we use that for social network analysis and learning analysis? Typically, we tend to look at uh, classes as a single, simple network that is focused on the instructor being at the middle and uh, actually reaching to every student. But as Min said, it's actually uh, proof that connection between students, uh, between peers, is actually uh, more effective to spread information, explain with their own world uh, what is important to know. Instructors may have what we also call the uh, curse of knowledge. When you know something, it may be difficult to explain it again to someone who doesn't know it because it's so obvious for you. So focusing and uh, use, le making leverage of peer learning is important. And ideally, we should actually try uh, to uh, aim at more peer learning activities and spread the network uh, with every student occupying, occupying the similar kind of position and opportunity for reaching out to each other. There are some MOOCs also that are uh, connective MOOCs, C MOOCs, uh, focusing on this kind of uh, learner-driven discussions uh, through different channels that will actually be uh, the best way to improve uh, their learning. We can distinguish three main kind of factors that will have an impact on uh, the network position. The first one is the teaching presence, the learning design, how we actually uh, think of uh, this goal in mind when we are designing the learning activities. The social presence will be the way students are involved and um, actually present themselves within the network, emotionally and so socially involved as a uh, real human being, not just a, um, um, 
not, not just getting some knowledge and not getting very involved, but uh, telling more about themselves, getting involved such as, hey, uh, my name is uh, this Alex, I'm living in a remote place and uh, I'm happy to uh, talk with you guys about these uh, classes. And the collective presence will be actually the uh, very learning outcome of uh, the activity and what they will make of, uh, what, what use they will make of this learning, how they will also share uh, their learning and their knowledge with other peers. This is also important uh, for academic performance and the research has been uh, implemented to see if there was <coughs> a real impact on your position in the network and the actual performance uh, in your studies. So social network analysis <coughs> tend to uh, also focus on weak ties, uh, relations that you may have uh, that are not your strong relationship, but people that you know in one way or the other, and uh, that will actually help you. We know that uh, when we are looking for jobs, the people you know uh, will make a big difference in uh, opening new opportunities for you. And that is true as, as well for learning and learning networks. If you have more connection with other people, you may give some feedback, give other explanation, uh, help in your, uh, in your work. And latent ties can be uh, here uh, conceived as connections that you have indirectly with other people because we are, you are in the same uh, classes, either physically or online and that will also create some potential uh, opportunities for you in the network. Here, for instance, this is a study from uh, Gazevich, and uh, they look at the different situation of students in uh, uh, this uh, network, and the impact of their uh, position in the network on their performance. They look at these different positions, such as degree, you know, the more connection you have, Betweenness, that is uh, actually these uh, gatekeepers between different groups. Closeness, that is the fastest uh, way to other people. And eccentricity, uh, which <coughs> is being far away from, uh, from others. And they found some uh, strong um, association between academic performance and some uh, degrees of uh, centrality, some uh, centrality, sorry, uh, being actually I will double check because it was a bit counterintuitive for me. Um, those with a high closeness or degree centrality <coughs> yeah, sorry, I want to be sure. Now closeness and eccentricity. So the second and the first one uh, have actually better academic performance and it's Maybe a bit uh, counterintuitive for the betweenness. We tend to be uh, associated with an influence role in the network, but turn out actually not to be uh, so beneficial for uh, these brokers. One of the explanations could be that uh, these uh, brokers spend more time broking between groups and get less benefits uh, from uh, this network. <laughs> So in a nutshell, uh, this paper uh, is, uh, is very interesting to look at this kind of uh, importance and uh, uh, implication of centrality in the network and academic performance. And it stresses on the fact that we have to uh, keep in mind to build a learning community when, when we are designing uh, some learning activities, to build these uh, learning communities and to be able to provide some counseling uh, for those who are on the edge of the network, we may, we may let, get less benefits from these activities and uh, uh, these interactions. Those uh, who are isolated, indeed, uh, can uh, actually get uh, frustrated and uh, uh, completely uh, uh, give up on their activities or get frustrated, for instance, because they are requesting some information online, some help, and no one is uh, replying to them. And here, uh, another study by uh, Shane Dawson uh, actually look at uh, this sense of community and uh, the, uh, the academic performance of the students. 
I recommend reading this paper from Dow Zone in 2008, who give a very good overview of this uh, network analysis, uh, dynamics, and uh, this different kind of uh, definition of centralities as well. Yeah, this is the closeness and the degree centrality, so having a lot of contacts and uh, short, con short uh, relation with others that are posit positively associated with a sense of community. Community, uh, in general speaking, in your social life, but also the learning community, getting, uh, uh, having the opportunity to uh, meet with people, uh, being uh, uh, trusty, feeling that you are actually dealing with real human and not uh, uh, just uh, with chatbots and so. And here again, we see this negative association uh, uh, with uh, betweenness. Yeah, so I want to stop there for uh, a short second to uh, ask you whether you have any questions, but also <laughs> to emphasize that you know, the different ways that we can engineer social networks out of the interactions in the learning management space. Right? So you have students interacting with material, you have students interacting with teachers, you have students interacting with peers, right? And sometimes if we uh, create a system where uh, peers can be messaged, you know, the, the instructor usually doesn't have any insight into that. Right? So it's important here from a privacy perspective as well. You may not want to, or may not be able to, from a legislative point of view, to read the messages that your students are sending to other students. But if you have set up your permissions properly, perhaps it's okay to know that they've actually contacted each other, but not the details of the message, right? This can help lay out the network graph as we've shown, right? And those types of infrastructure that help you uh, understand, you know, what is the academic performance and the social aspects, I think, are very important, right? Because we are concerned about uh, students losing out or perhaps becoming uh, too stressed. We want to know that they're uh, well connected to the fabric of the learning space, right? And so we see this uh, as Alex introduced that when we have students that are brokering between two networks but not well connected otherwise. They can be uh, very stressed out because they have different peers to talk to, but they can also be the ones that are catalyzing a lot of creative or interesting innovative ideas because they're the ones that are taking the ideas from different parties and then trying to make integration of stuff. The problem with this type of relationship, as Alex said before, is that sometimes this type of uh, creativeness doesn't come well in hand with academic performance, right? The, that there can be two different sides. So when we are as curriculum designers, we need to think about whether we want to emphasize creativity, or we want to emphasize academic performance, and perhaps the two can be uh, complements to each other, but are sometimes in competition. Um, here, uh, you, we have at uh, ALSEPS a uh, pilot study going on, uh, looking at uh, the relation of uh, students uh, across NUS and um, distinguishing here uh, the different kind of uh, students based on their faculty, different colors, and their GPA, <laughs> their average uh, grade, and on the size of uh, the cycle of the load. So we can see that uh, we have different cluster based on faculty communities, some based on their uh, CAP community, their average grade point or lower one. And some play the role of connectors, these brokers. Uh, here, for instance, between uh, the, the business and school and the science or uh, computing ones. Or uh, here, this uh, very single individual that is connecting also people from the business school and a uh, few ones uh, isolated here. And finally, we can also distinguish some isolated communities <laughs> that are not linked to uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Can you guess who these students are, those two, two groups there? Yeah. Yeah. They're engineers, but they actually are foreign students. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, right? Yes. So we have students they come from international communities, they right. feel more connected with language from, uh, among their own communities. Right. And the difficult thing here is we want to make sure they're well integrated into our fabric. Mm -hmm. right? Because if they're not, if they have problems with being uh, low performers, 
they don't seek help, yeah. then they'll have a terrible experience here, right? Yeah. So this is this uh, yellow color that we see, low CAP fringe, right? So students who are on the fringe of the network and not performing well, okay? That is what macroscopically we can do with social network analysis. We can identify this community, and then we can zoom in on that community and say, who are the important people in this network? Right, so Alex mentioned earlier eigenvectors, right? Who are the important speakers for this network? If I, as an instructor, can identify those people and individually reach out to them, maybe I can get them to help me help the entire cadre, right? Why, why, why talk to all of them when I can talk to one person and then have that person affect others? Okay, so this is the power of, of doing uh, social analytics at scale, right? We have a large cohort. This is really big data, right? This is actually very hard to pull all of this data together and canonicalize it. But when we do it and we can visualize it, we can start to make sense of what's going on. Meaning, can you just understand uh, the yes. size of the plot? Yeah. What so, does that mean? So, um, uh, how do you define the interaction? So, the, the bigger the size, the adults, the better the GPA, the better the academic performance. And the connections are uh, made by looking at their uh, relation online on uh, the learning management system at the US. And the students who are involved in discussion to uh, projects and uh, sharing a discussion online uh, will be uh, associated. Yeah, the student calls on the whole platform. How do you draw the relationship with this? Because they will be involved in the same discussion or the same uh, group. In the project. So once somebody pulls something, yeah. uh, it is immediately gone to the entire group. Yeah. So it, it, it can be done through, let's say, looking at which threads a student participates on. So typically in NUS, we have a discussion forum for each module, but each discussion forum has sub forums, right? So they might have introduced a thread for, okay, I didn't understand this uh, exercise, right? So here we're looking at all the students that participate in that thread are connected to each other, right? And they can also direct message in some cases, right? So you, you think of those connections as uh, 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 an edge. Of course, here we're showing the edge without directed edges. So that's an, another network choice you can make. You can say, oh, I communicated with you. So I have a directed edge towards you. You're not, you're not talking to me, I'm talking to you, okay? So you can also make those types of games here. But in this case, we're just drawing the network to say that there was communication between these two individuals. So, uh, like Alex was saying, there are certain groups here that, that definitely are uh, well connected to each other. Like here is a, a case of a, uh, a high performing community that seems to be somewhat uh, mixed, right? We have students from engineering, FOE, some students from faculty of science, some students from FASS. So this is a, 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 a multidiscipline, uh, high performing network. Maybe they came from the same uh, secondary institution, for example. Right. Okay. Uh, and then we have other ones that, uh, like I said here, uh, maybe their circles are a little smaller. They're on the edge of the network. We're uh, a little bit more worried about these particular folks, uh, perhaps not not being engaged appropriately with, with our learning environment. Okay. So the whole point of this is again to, to understand this at a macroscopic level, and then try to figure out good intervention. As I said before, we need to know the research questions things that we want to figure out in order for us to use the data appropriately. Otherwise, these are just pretty pictures, okay? Pretty pictures don't do anyone any good unless they can be actionable. So here are just a, a few questions uh, that uh, you can also uh, uh, keep in mind for a later discussion. How we can uh, monitor the network of students uh, through uh, the Students uh, learning uh, space. Um, is the current learning design is more uh, instructor centered or learner oriented centered? How could you shift uh, from the current uh, design to a, a more learner driven network? And what kind of uh, consulting solution uh, could be provided to isolated students in order to compensate uh, those who are out of the network? 
So these types of thought questions we want you to keep in mind because later when we break to our small groups and do exercises, we're all going to do role playing with different stakeholders in mind. And uh, you can think about the four case studies that uh, we're all doing. So maybe I'm sick and we are a bit uh, behind schedule. I think we're okay, yes. yeah, sure. Uh, go back to your question. So given that you've done this uh, whole networking kind of understanding of the dynamics of students, and so what is NUS preferred approach? You are going more towards instructor centered, peer oriented, or learner driven networks. <laughs> which, which is the angle? Which direction are you going? So this is a great question. I think it comes back to what Pablo Largo said, which is you need to identify channels. Okay, individuals in your uh, institution have certain passion, and they know their students and what's right for them. So there's no prescriptive strategy that integrates everything well. Okay, it's just definitely instructor or discipline specific. So for some disciplines, uh, they say, okay, maybe it needs to be more holistic. I want to look at adaptive learning, but not from a student's uh, perspective, because perhaps the students haven't mastered the material yet. Other ones where uh, there's more discussion involved, maybe they can have more transactive behaviors, I'll talk a little bit more about that, where students are building on each other's discussion, then here facilitation seems more useful. So the what we have done as in terms of the analysis and bringing this picture up mm -hmm. is then disseminated to the respective designers for them to determine how they want to drive their design. Is that, is that how it's done? This is still the early stage, I guess. Yeah, it's still the early stage for NUS. We haven't gotten the entire framework that Avalardo laid down, so we, we, we weren't as informed uh, when we started our journey. But our hope is that. Uh, you know, MOU can make a more concerted effort around this LA cycle. Yeah, so for us, it's been uh, a bit more uh, bottom up and top down as well. Uh, there has been, and we can talk about this later over the final discussion, uh, a vision of NUS having a data lake, a large data warehouse that's useful for individual researchers and faculty to answer research questions. But because it's driven by faculty, instead of having a direct mandate, from uh, the management to answer certain direct questions, it's a little bit more piecemeal. But we can go over those problems again later. So the other thing is that it seems quite counterintuitive. Someone who is more a loner seems to be doing much better, while we have been like, focusing quite a fair bit about collaborative learning, or we want to get the network set up, and so on and so forth. So, so how do you how do you unpack that and how do you reconcile with the finding and what should we do now? Well, one possibility will be that uh, actually it's those who are uh, isolated, so it's not always that they are they are associated with bigger performance, but sometimes indeed that could be with eccentricity being actually. Uh, associated with good performance. It could be that actually those who know and work on their own may not be able, uh, may not need to reach out to other students. So they appear as isolated from the network because actually they are working on their own and they don't need to uh, interact with other peers to understand better and so so that could be a possibility, I guess. I think the other thing that is very important to realize is that any analytic solution is going to be missing data. Okay, uh, We don't know what our students are doing out of SLS. Right? They're doing lots of things. They're looking at YouTube, they're looking at Khan Academy. All these other things are analytics that other platforms are capturing, but not ours. So, so I think the other thing is that I don't know whether I don't study statistics, but I don't know that that um, the degree and the betweenness did became insignificant because of the interaction of the different groups and by virtue of the zero sum game and you can set everything out and then it became insignificant in some way because some really truly benefited and some really don't benefit or your incentive group is really small and therefore sometimes the data that accentuate that when you have a smaller pool, maybe it can sort of like accentuate the positive outcome.
um, I don't know whether it might be could be correct. If my reading is correct, and you want to point me, please tell me. But anyway, uh, <laughs> 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 anyway uh, I, I, I think I'm just very curious about this. And um, in the context of MOD, uh, actually, there is a lot of things that you can consider because <coughs> of full subject based spending. <coughs> When you go into full subject based spending and you want to see the interactions between the different groups between the same formula and so on and so forth. Um, because this is actually much more digital space, right? Yes. And uh, whether there's a way to look at relations beyond the digital space, is that about data collection? How do we collect data? Right? Yes, yes. So uh, I've already mentioned that you can get self-reports, right? You can ask students to self-report. You can also get the uh, instructors to fill out information on their students. Uh, again, data is very, uh, you're limited at, at what types of conclusions you can draw based on the data that you get, right? So no matter what, when we're doing analytics, there's always missing data. And you have the decision to either deal with it explicitly by trying to collect it or trying to impute it. That means, you know, guess at what the missing data could be. But in this right. case, was it self-reporting or was it just drawn from the system? So here it was based on uh, the information of the uh, uh, online master uh, of the University in Canada. And they use this uh, information over uh, several years in order to, uh, to get this. In the other study uh, from uh, Dawson, it was a mix of uh, information collected online and actually uh, a survey plus some interviews with some students to uh, have a better understanding of uh, uh, these trends and what they mean by uh, feeling uh, in, in part of the community, uh, feeling distressed or not, and so. So I think it's interesting also to stress on the fact that indeed there are some. Uh, you know, data that we can collect and uh, analyze and uh, there are also some missing ones and it's important to complement this with other approaches. So it's not purely quantitative? Not purely because it has been complete, uh, completed with uh, some uh, qualitative one. Thank you very much. I think we just want to emphasize you know that uh, I think these studies show you the power of looking at the statistical data, right? If we were to think about what our guesses would be, we would probably be wrong about that, right? So by collecting a large amount of data, big data, and crunching it through our statistics, we can show that weak ties are actually very, very uh, uh, an important part. We all already know that. I mean, in some ways, when we think about how people in our network get jobs, it's actually not through direct relations. It's through people that you know that you know, right? And that makes a, a big brokering effect. Right? So those types of things are, are useful relationships that we want to promote for certain types of knowledge. Right? Not all of the academic performance is going to be based on that. Great question. So uh, please do spend, uh, you know, as you go through the case studies, we've compiled a couple of questions for you to think about. Uh, and we have an expert at NUS, his name is Quan. Uh, he drew the diagram that you saw earlier um, using open source software, which of course uh, you don't have to purchase. You can just uh, have an expert uh, learn how to use these tools. We can help you with that. Uh, and then uh, you can go to all of these uh, particular uh, proceedings. They're all linked on the, the website, uh, the slides that you have. So as we say, we don't have all the information and uh, we don't always, we don't know what is going on behind uh, the computer uh, when the students are working online. So it's also uh, important to be able to uh, take some clues about uh, where their behavior and to build some behavior detectors that are actually uh, models that can infer from the logs uh, what is going on and how uh, the students are behaved uh, during these activities. So that helps to assess a student's performance, uh, how they are working, how, what's their relation with the activities, uh, is it engaging or not, uh, how we can improve the learning system and the learning uh, design. And it's also uh, important to define how much uh, freedom, how much control we can give the learner, or if we have to make something that is actually very well 
uh, define uh, the frame uh, for the students. So uh, Baker uh, has uh, worked on uh, this kind of uh, disengaged behaviors, and there are several papers uh, given uh, at the end of the presentation that we can uh, refer to. And uh, he has uh, developed some ways to assess this kind of disengaged behavior. The first one, of course, is just being inactive. Uh, so this is uh, uh, staring into space, uh, reading something else while there is a video going, uh, or taking a short nap during the exercise, and so. Another one would be what he calls off task. It could be uh, a solitary behavior, uh, that is uh, uh, anything that does not involve the software, uh, checking your phone, for instance, uh, or uh, not uh, doing something with someone else. That would be the right conversation, uh, talking with other students during the exercise uh, of uh, another subject than the course. The third one is uh, a bit less obvious, it's carelessness, or what you call uh, careless errors. That is uh, the kind of error that you will do, not because you don't know, but just because you don't care enough to try hard enough. So if you thought uh, well about it, you could have found the answer, but you didn't. System gaming is also very interesting. This is a way that uh, students will use the system, uh, will use, for instance, the help uh, in the system or the various uh, possibilities they have to answer in order to go through the system without learning, actually. So that could be, uh, what's the answer? One, wrong, try again, two, three, four, five, six, and <laughs> oh, you, 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 you did it. Um, and the fifth one, that is uh, called uh, suddenly without thinking fastidiously uh, behaviors uh, are actually relation with the systems that have anything to do uh, that is not related to the learning activities. So for instance, if you have to uh, plot some cities on the map and you draw a smiley face and <laughs> say. <laughs> so these are the kind of disengaged behavior that you can face with students uh, on this kind of system. Yeah, so I want to emphasize here also that, you know, when you go to a learning management system, you know, the teacher's not there, they're not present. So your behavior becomes sort of anonymous in some ways. You should do lots of funny things when you're online that you don't expect students to do. And the key thing about trying to do behavior detection is trying to figure out what is the signal from all of that, right? Because sometimes they're not engaged or they're, you know, doing things like Alex said, there's another example where in a virtual world, uh, uh, you know, the children end up feeding bananas to a monkey and, you know, <laughs> uh, instead of actually trying to solve the puzzle, which is to cure an infection disease, right? Because, you know, a virtual world uh, has a lot of different things you can interact with. So students, of course, they, they think of it as a playground, right? So uh, the other thing I want to highlight is, uh, you know, carelessness. I think, Alex, are you going to talk about carelessness? Oh, uh, no. Okay. So carelessness is very interesting in the sense that, you know, carelessness has two different aspects to it, okay? Sometimes carelessness is exactly what Alex is saying, uh, you know, that people are not thinking hard enough about it because, you know, they're in a virtual environment. It's not like the teacher standing in and saying, what's the answer to this question? They're not on the spot. So they can be careless, right? But in fact, when we look at errors in the system and we don't do behavior detection, we think of carelessness as a bad thing. Right? We think, okay, this student got a lot of questions wrong. Is it really because they didn't know the subject matter? Or is it because it's not compelling enough? Okay, and I, I just, I don't care. I just want to get through the exercise and just do all everything and just finish, right? But then because they have tons of errors, we may misidentify them as a challenge student when in fact they're not. They're actually bored, okay? So when we can do this behavior detection, we can factor out what are the causes for this carelessness, right? Is it really because the student hasn't mastered the material? Or they've mastered it so well that they don't want to engage in the materials any longer, okay? When we factor this out, we can find that carelessness is actually uh, correctly, uh, uh, correctly gauged as a problem for learners. But if we didn't factor this out, okay, we will find actually in the studies that were published that carelessness is a good predictor of performance. Good performance, right? Because what we find is that disengaged learners make a lot of careless errors, but they are not to say that they haven't mastered the subject, okay? 
So being able to detect the correct behavior is very important. Otherwise, we may end up with the wrong conclusion. We may decide that carelessness is positively correlated with learning, okay, which it's not. So these are, these are the kind of uh, uh, behaviors that we may uh, face. And how can we actually use uh, learning analytics to track them? So there are different sources of data on such behaviors. The first one uh, could be set reports. But actually, uh, if you uh, imagine uh, such a sitting, you can't really expect students to say, yeah, I actually I have cheated the system, or I was napping during the exercise. So set reports is actually not such a good uh, way to uh, get uh, the more information on this behavior. Field observation will, would require someone in the classroom uh, to uh, observe students, uh, so they will need, uh, of course, some manpower and uh, to be maybe more admitted uh, to some students and to uh, specific phases of, uh, of the exercise. Text replays can be uh, interesting. You can go through uh, the, the logs, actually, of the activity and uh, understand better what is going on. Uh, such, for instance, with this uh, log on the right. So I took the screenshots from Baker because I, I couldn't find a, a better one. And uh, indeed, we can see that uh, the first time the student provided uh, an answer that is wrong, and uh, he was offered the opportunity to do it again. So he gave the same answer, actually, uh, one second later, and it's still wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so he wait for uh, 58 uh, Second, I, it's seven minutes. I think it's a whole bit seven. And uh, he told the computer, maybe you should die. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's the thing. <laughs> still telling that he's wrong. Uh, and then he requests help uh, on, the, on the software. He reads something, and uh, after 30 seconds again, he just had a lot of question marks, <laughs> and it's still wrong. So this is a, so the kind of flows actually that would be useful to track this kind of uh, behaviors. And finally, video coding uh, could be uh, also a way uh, to uh, assess this kind of behaviors. It's a bit of field observation, but it, re it requires less manpower, but more uh, technical um, skills. And it can be actually very um, challenging to implement well and it can provide you with a lot of other data that are even more difficult to process and to analyze. So video coding is becoming more and more automated. You may have read uh, reports that in China, they're using cameras from one of the startups called SenseTime to monitor classrooms. Yeah, so they're trying to look uh, whether students fall asleep or not off. But you know, <laughs> from a privacy perspective, that becomes very difficult. Right, so we have to think about that. Uh, so this is why we still think video coding is a good method. You know, if you have a, a field officer in the classroom observing, uh, that is a less intrusive way than say blanketing uh, classrooms with cameras everywhere, right? And then there, there are a lot of privacy concerns in those cases. So making use of behavior detection uh, is uh, indeed very uh, useful. It's uh, also a big challenge for uh, learning analytics. But we have to uh, stress on some caveats. Uh, that first actually doesn't provide a clear truth on student behavior. Uh, we could also miss something here again. Uh, the data is not uh, clear enough to provide clear information on what's going on. And uh, we could say that the behavior level detection is no easy. There are a lot, a lot of other factors that are uh, that have to be uh, taken into consideration, and that may take it make it difficult uh, to understand. Um, there are a lot of issues also uh, about accuracy and validity of the model. Uh, I didn't develop this uh, for today. That this is more technical and uh, statistical approach. But uh, what has been developed in one context, theoretical model, could actually face a lot of difficulties when you try to implement it in a real uh, classroom setting or a real online uh, learning platform. And so this is not a perfect solution, but this is still a second best solution that is uh, good enough 
to try to assess what is going on and face this kind of uh, issues. So here again, a few thought questions uh, for a later discussion. Maybe you have already noticed this kind of uh, trends of uh, disengaged behavior, uh, either in the classroom or with the feedback you got based on some curriculum design you, you are involved in. Maybe you could think of the kind of uh, resources <laughs> to detect and cope uh, this kind of behavior in the classroom and the, the module that you design. How could we uh, try to do so? And what other factors should we consider uh, to increase the robustness of such a model? Uh, for instance, uh, they may have some other uh, social factors that we have to take into consideration if we don't want to misinterpret some behaviors uh, as disengaging one, whereas they are actually uh, related to other factors, either the classroom settings or the, uh, the very nature, the very characteristics of the students. So uh, this is a, a fairly new, uh, a fairly new topic for research. Uh, at the US and I said we also try to look at this kind of thing. And uh, here you have some papers, um, mostly uh, by uh, Baker, which is uh, actually a reference on this uh, on this matter that uh, we can also refer to. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take uh, the final segment before we break for our uh, exercise. So we do want to make sure we have enough time to do that. It's much more fun to do it interactively. Uh, but uh, I'm going to talk to you about my expertise, which is textual analytics. So uh, right uh, just now, we heard a lot from Alex about logs, right? So looking at logs and looking at how networks uh, uh, can be drawn. But what about the language that our students are using? Can we actually use that? Because right now we're just looking at, you know, edges and, and uh, behaviors, right? So definitely, uh, I think the important part here is that we want to use it to complement, not to supplant. Because many times we can do traces and log analysis in a way that's not intrusive, right? But when we start to study the language, then we start to worry about this privacy uh, and ethical constraints, right? So you probably know uh, a lot of systems out there read lots of what you do. You use Facebook or you use Gmail, all of that is being read by the systems. Um, not any human behind it, but uh, we definitely want the human in the loop for uh, learning analytics. Okay, so uh, what do we mean by textual analytics? Okay, it means uh, analyzing the words that are being used by the learners or the teachers using uh, computational techniques for looking at my, uh, uh, words, right? And the current methods that uh, my lab and a lot of labs now use are the deep learning ones, uh, which use uh, uh, a technical term called word embeddings, which is just to say that we have better ways of representing the semantics of words than, uh, you know, even 10 years ago. Okay? Um, uh, the important thing about this is that words are defined by their context, right? So when you use a word in a specific discipline or in a specific scenario, it means something specific to that, okay? So if you just use very simple methods, just to say count the number of words or look for this word, it's bound to have a lot more errors, okay? So we need to make use of the context in which the word lives in in order to make sense of that word, okay? And how the text is obtained is really, really important. Sometimes we have Textual transcripts, let's say later when I upload this to YouTube, there'll be automatic captions that come out from this, okay? But sometimes they can be learner entered. For example, in SLS, many times the student has to type something in. Are they typing the way that you want them to type with full grammar, with full punctuation? Obviously not, right? So then we need to cater our natural language processing, our analytics to be able to handle that type, right? For example, if you have a speech transcript, they'll be missing punctuation. You can't see the period and, and the comma there, but they, they, they need to be there in order for a lot of textual systems to work. Okay, so I'm gonna look at uh, two specific areas uh, for the end of this uh, talk today, which is on sentiment analysis, because I know many of you wanted to hear about sentiment and emotion, and also on transactive behaviors. I'll tell you what that means. Okay. 
So I just want to impress you, <coughs> natural language is infinitely fascinating. Okay, this is my life study. I love it so much because words mean so many different things. Okay, take a look at this. Uh, all right. So when we talk about trying to do sentiment analysis, there's usually three components, right? So we can think about uh, the subject, who is expressing the opinion. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, the subject, what is the target of the opinion? Who is the expressing the opinion? And what type of relationship they're trying to express, okay? So are you talking about polarity? This is what we usually think about, a positive or negative rating of five stars for this product, two stars for that one. Uh, or is the argument being made subjective or objective? Okay. Or even emotion, right? Emotion and polarity are somewhat orthogonal, but correlated, right? And then also the strength of them, how strong is the valence of that, right? Because that could matter a lot. If you have somebody who's very polar in your arguments, then maybe it's hard for them to be consensus, right? So aspects, there are many different aspects. It's a much more complicated thing than you uh, may think about. But I just want you to uh, stress upon this point about context dependence. And you have the word large. Large is not something that immediately strikes people as a, like a sentiment word. I mean, how can it be sentiment? We do all the time. Okay? Lots of words have sentiment, right? So if I say this poem has a large screen, you're like, hmm. Actually, that's not a bad thing, right? Because then I can watch videos without squinting at it, right? So it's not so bad. But if you say large phone, okay, too big to fit in my pocket, you know, to weigh down my purse, all these things, not so good, right? So for example, just that one word, which we don't really think of having sentiment, actually carries sentiment and it's context. Okay? So there are other things that are in this uh, definition as well. So even times when we don't Think of a statement as having uh, an opinion or uh, a sentiment, it's there, right? So she returned the assignments three weeks instead of the usual one. That's a factual statement, but that is saying something about that teacher, right? Saying something negative, right? Uh, so the teacher is very patient. There's an explicit thing. We can say patience. There's a key word. I want to be able to capture that. I can use keywords for that, but try to do it for the second one. Not so simple, right? Okay. And holistic versus a special sentiment. This is what you, you get at. Okay, when you go to TripAdvisor, you go to Lazada, you see, you know, they raise how many stars, right? That's a holistic sentiment. But then they ask you, how was your service? How was your food? Okay. All those are aspects of an experience. Okay. So we want to capture all of these things. They can tell us <coughs> even when somebody is giving a rating or a review, we want to know at which level should we apply the analysis. Because if we just use a holistic view department for capturing things, we're going to miss out the details. Right? To, to ask, I mean, we all know this when we ask for student feedback on our teachers, we don't give them one metric. I mean, we give them a whole set of metrics because those are the things, different qualities and different strengths that we have as teachers. Right? The same goes for our students expressing sentiment. Okay, so you see this all the time. In fact, anyone who uses e commerce does this, right? So, many times when we want to make recommendations for what a student does next, or what type of exercise they should do as a result of something, we can do this process of automated recommendation. Okay, in fact, I'm working with SSG to do this type of work for our skills future. Okay, so if people take skills future courses, we want to know what other courses they should do to this level up. We do this thing called uh, recommendation systems. Okay, the easiest way to think about this is something called collaborative filtering. Collaborative means exactly what it sounds like. People collaborating together. Filtering also means exactly what it sounds like, which is that people work together to provide a signal. Okay, what they're doing is something like people like you also like, right? So you see this recommendation all the time. Okay, so abstractly we can think of it as two different parts. All right, users or students or teachers and items which are curricular uh, objectives, activities, assessments, okay? And what we want to know are how these things correlate to each other, and they do this through some type of expressive opinion or ranking, or perhaps how well they do on that particular subject matter, okay? So we can say, we want to find a way of uh, enabling that topic, and people like you also liked, right? So what I can do is say, students like you, in, 
impact. Uh, they've done the same types of videos that you make with a whole basket of things that they can do. Maybe they do the same CCAs or something of this sort, okay? We band them together and say, oh, there's other students like you across this network. What did they do? Okay. And then we can think about how they rated those items. You know? So uh, this can be the case when you think about a new item being introduced. They have a new CCA introduced or a new activity introduced. Who is going to take them up? Okay. So I know a particular student in the class did this one, but I know other students who are like that student might also like that. Right. So I have a way of scaffolding the introduction and recommending new activities that are not seen before by students to, to the right stakeholders, right? We don't necessarily want our entire cohort doing the same exercise. We want to choose the exercises that are right for them. Okay. So sentiment analysis can uh, help with this process, right? You can think that, you know, when I have comparative statements, or oh, I like teacher X or I like uh, exercise why better than another one? Or through localization to certain aspects, meaning that you know maybe I would know that students in a certain uh, room or a certain uh, CCA through uh, other activities that I can uh, design what type of recommendations fit them. Okay. So that was one part. I think to me this is much more interesting. The idea of transactivity. What is transactivity? Transactivity is very simple. When I say something and you build on it on your discussion, this is exactly what we want when we talk about peer learning, or even when we want our students to come back and talk to us, right? We don't want them parroting our model answer because we don't know whether they have the right answer or their understanding. Right? We want to frame it in their minds and see whether they can build upon what they've said, what we've said. Okay? So, for example, in the dialogue here, okay, A said something, blah, 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 and then B replies, you know, blah, blah, I think something about A, all right? Build on the statement that A did, okay? And then C comes back and say, you know, that was a great point, B, but I think A meant this, okay? So we see this type of transaction, okay, in a dialogic manner, meaning that parties <coughs> are talking and building on each other's statements. This is very important for certain types of disciplines like humanities and science, right? We want each other to build upon the contributions of the other learners and also the teachers, right? So at NUS, we're doing this type of work where we're taking a large corpus of uh, interactions in our LMS, our learning management system, and trying to do the coding, the manual coding of all these types of different interactions, ones that are uh, by peers such as when peers request feedback from each other, or they try to paraphrase to test their understanding of what the content was delivered, or they juxtapose, they make two different arguments, they put them together in some way, and that becomes a new idea that can transform the learner learning, right? Okay. Also on the instructor side, you know, our instructors are there to facilitate, they're not there to govern the learning, right? They're there to say, can you think more about that? Can you elaborate on what you're talking about? Can I bring together some outside information and have you think about it, critique it, right? And can I integrate all the discussions that you guys are all doing as learners together to sum up and crystallize, synthesize what is going on in the discussion, right? So uh, there's this framework for doing this type of thing called a council talk. It's basically based on a transactivity. So it's uh, the idea of what a teacher might be able to do in facilitating this, right? And so when we're using natural language processing and textual analytics to do this, we want to identify when are good times to offer this type of feedback to students, right? So if I can use textual analytics to say, okay, I've seen several points, now I want the students to summarize them or I want them to expand upon them, when is a good time to ask the teacher to prompt to do this? Okay. So, for example, you know, uh, this is a genetics uh, a module. So they're, they're talking about dominant and recessive genes. For example, so they can uh, challenge the student to think about why certain genes might uh, produce babies of a certain color in cats, okay? or uh, you know, to try to ask students to restate so they, they have mastery over the ideas that were presented to them by another student. Okay. Or uh, to try to build transactively on other people's explanations, right? 
can you, in your own words, can you explain why she's right or wrong? So all these terms are being engineered based on the fact that we might be able to look at the analytics of what is being expressed by the student, being looking at the log traces of what the students are saying, how they're saying it to each other, and then using it again with the teacher in the loop, okay, not on its own to, to offer this. So here's one case of, of, of this in practice. This was actually done automated without the teacher. Okay, so I want to present both possibilities to you and have you think about it. All right. Sometimes it's good to have the teacher in the loop. Sometimes because we want immediate feedback and we don't have enough teachers there, okay, it would be great if we had teachers for every student. Then we want the system to do some of the work. Okay. So uh, this is a science uh, a lab. Okay, where uh, they're offered some materials to think about. And then the students have to uh, narrate what activities go on, all right? So what's going on here is this, uh, the agent, the, the, uh, the intelligent tutoring system, is basically looking at the input that the student has written, okay? The student has written this input, and then they're trying to see whether those statements are similar enough, okay, to what a teacher or curriculum designer has already specified. If it's similar enough, then you can just revoice it and have the students reflect on whether that is the correct way of saying it. Right? So instead of basically the glucose will get inside, maybe what we could say is instead, maybe you could say that as the cell membrane is permeable to glucose. Okay? Right? The other way it happens is that when the system is not able to detect that it's close enough, but contains certain key vocabulary, all right, from a science context, maybe this is the case where so it doesn't know exactly what's going on, okay? So we can ask the student, okay, given that information that you said some keywords, can you explain it in a more clear manner, voice it such that uh, the agent or the other students in the session can understand? <coughs> okay, so I want to turn it to some work that I've been doing in my own lab. So we've been looking at uh, massive online open courses. So you can think that you might have a, a large uh, discussion forum for an entire school or something of the sort. And here we're really trying to make sure that we use the instructor's time effectively. Okay. So in small classrooms, it's okay. You have enough uh, bandwidth as a teacher to look through each and every interaction, but not in the case of a loop, right? An online massive online open course typically has tens of thousands of students. Every day you go into discussion forum, it's like you came off of a three month vacation where you talk to Saturday. Okay? So if you came back from a vacation, you only have 15 minutes to answer emails. Which one are you going to answer? Okay? Challenging, right? Because what we all do is look at the first one and just answer that one. Okay, well, the rest, forget it, I don't have time. Okay? So what we want to do is use automation, use natural language processing to predict which ones are useful to. Uh, analyze and to reply to. So triage problem, right? Do you call on the phone to DBS Bank? They do the same thing and say, you know, tell me what your thing is, and then I'll route you to the right customer. Agent. What we're trying to say is, which one of these discussions is more urgent? Okay, you need to uh, your uh, uh, information and input right away. Okay, so uh, this is the prototype that we fielded in NUS. It looks like a regular discussion forum, as you can see here. Okay. The only difference is, just like you have uh, some mail clients, you have an importance indicator. Okay, so we don't want to mess up how the uh, instructors think about the discussion forum. We don't want to reorder things. We just want to tell them, okay, I think this discussion is important. Okay, so this is again working with the instructors and understanding what their use cases. All right, and so when they come across a, a particular intervention that needs their help. The system will explain this question. The topic is unresolved, and it looks like the intervention is definitely recommended for this particular uh, discussion. Okay, so this is a way that we can uh, help uh, scaffold and uh, direct uh, the teacher's part. Now, I want to have emphasize one other thing about this. Sometimes there are interventions that are timely. Okay, like for example, right before midterm, like my midterm is next week, we have lots of questions to ask. But sometimes we remember instructors not for their timeliness, but for their 
uh, ability to sum up and integrate and expand our knowledge, right? So we, we, we won't cite best teacher awards for people that just answer emails quickly, right? Or interventions quickly. It's about the context and making the learner more effective and holistic, right? So there's two different branches of triage that we want to do. We want to do triage for urgent things, but we also want to triage for important things, right? Places where we think there is a critical need for the instructor to line up certain points together so that they can capture the learner's inquisitiveness. So that's another part of the learning analytics, textual analytics we wish to do. Okay, I'll just uh, try to close with a couple of small things here. Okay. What we've seen in a lot of studies in research is that uh, in learning analytics or natural language processing, there's a lot of claims about the effectiveness of certain types of <coughs> automatic interventions. My student, one of my doctoral students, tried to do this at scale. He took 60 different massive online open courses from many different subject areas and tried out several different papers. Guess what? They all didn't work. Why? Because those papers were based on one study of one specific instructor, of one specific discipline. Okay? It doesn't generalize. What does generalize? <coughs> What generalizes is the fact that we all use English to communicate, okay, in the case of things that we study here. We're not talking about discipline-specific vocabulary. What we want to look at is the words that help to build transactivity, okay, contrasts, uh, <clears throat> arguments, okay? All of these types of things help us decide whether something is being transacted. And it's not specific to the vocabulary of the particular subject matter. Okay? This is the only thing that we were able to find out that actually generalizes to lots of different disciplines. This is why at the beginning I emphasized to you it needs to be discipline and level specific. Okay? Otherwise, you have a very, very blunt weapon you can use at your disposal. Okay? You need to have the curriculum designer, you need to have the subject matter expert there to guide you. Okay, so we're almost finished with our case study. So I ask you, where does your learners produce the text if they have any? Okay. How much of the produced text are actually discipline specific? Right? If you want to do more effective textual analytics, you have to put in the effort to understand what it is that is <coughs> correlated to your learning objective. Okay? And our transactive behaviors, if you think about it in a specific context, something that you really want to capture, right? If peers or uh, they're interacting with an instructor, or something that they, uh, if you want to have a uh, analytics for, which is very, very important. Okay, so uh, I'm one of the uh, members in Offset that do this, and there are, uh, I guess, just like I said before, a couple of different papers here. Okay, so now we come to the hands on part of the exercise. Okay. 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 Now, yeah. so we need to be more sure the hands on the paper. You go through the questions, All right. and we turn some of the time to question and answers. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's a good time to break for questions first. Shall we do that? So uh, we can hear from the floor whether you guys have any uh, questions for us. Then we'll get into the hands on. We presented four different case studies. Sorry, this day was just very fast. Let me just go back off and just talk. Okay. So we looked at uh, first scaling personalized feedback. We saw adaptive methods for doing peer feedback. Uh, and, and using pure explanations. We talked, Alex talked about the group dynamics, looking at the traces of an LMS and trying to establish the network position of students and what it means in terms of their learning outcomes and uh, their social <coughs> well connectedness. Okay. Then uh, Alex also talked about uh, you know, detecting disengaged behaviors and other types of behaviors within a learning management system because otherwise, usually we don't have any insight into what these people are doing because you don't see them, right? You see them. Only through their traces. 
and finally, we talk a little bit about uh, emotional learning analytics, but mostly about textual analytics. How did you can use sentiment analysis or transactivity to understand this? Yeah, just one uh, slightly broader question, but uh, because we we all know that you it wasn't covered in the thing, but I'm not sure how much we we go in there. And that is how to what are some of the what are some of the considerations that we should take into cognizance if we have to do a dashboard um to create a dashboard here what are some of the things that we should think about or look out for when we need to create a dashboard here? so i think dashboards can be very useful but they can also be overwhelming this is why especially if you're creating a dashboard for the instructor or for the student maybe it's not so effective to let it you know have, have so many those things right it's better to have a specific objective in mind for the dashboard this is why in the other intervention you saw earlier they didn't have a dashboard right basically they said we're going to email you something okay these are the action items you can do there's no ambiguity here all right you just do this 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 and this it will help you right sometimes you go into a dashboard there's so much data there you don't know what you're going to do with it right so it depends on your use case you need to think about again what the question is, and then again, these I challenge you as curriculum designers to think about what are the key activities, what are the key ways that you can use data at mass in order to answer those. Okay. Sometimes we see people putting dashboards for the sake of a dashboard, and that usually results in something like what you see in the car, not very useful, right? So uh, we need to think about what is the key objective. I think for each particular uh, uh, subject matter, there will be certain questions that we can ask that we can use data to complement. Okay? Again, they don't supplant, they don't substitute at all for what we do in the classroom as a teacher. Right? We just want to give a little bit more evidence to uh, how we can help our work. Yeah. I don't think that quite answers you, uh, but it is hard to give a generic answer to what types of information is in the dashboard. Sometimes what we can do is we can think about uh, generic uh, engagement uh, measures. For example, as we saw in the first case, maybe the number of minutes of video watch, number of activities done, uh, number of uh, answers given correctly or something. But then it still really takes a lot of interpretation, right? From the uh, curriculum experts to say, okay, not all of these questions were created to say. Okay? Some of these were basic, some of these were hard, and then to be able to understand that and network that. There's a lot of sense making involved in the dashboard. Great question. So, other questions, please? On yeah. um, dynamic experimentation, yes. <coughs> you mentioned that uh, the concept of EB testing. So, EB testing is a like one of the relevant two. Uh, so, in your rounds, because eventually the system will generate the multiple responses, would that be a case when the user is to pick the best among them? Because it's easier for the brain to pick the better among two. Yes, yeah, so we don't want to actually um, make our learners too confused. So what happens in that type of experiment is we only show them one condition. But because we have a lot of different things going through, and we can uh, present each condition to multiple students at uh, different times. Okay? Sometimes we do have to normalize that. Though. So for example, we all know certain people who always rate things fantastic. Always, right? And other people will always say, this was wrong, it's terrible, right? So you have to regularize that as well, right? You have to say, okay, I know this learner is always a bit negative, so I have to normalize their, their input here, right? Yes, great question. Okay, so I think it's a good time to have more energy from you. Okay, so just we'll get uh, more questions. Right. So we'll go to the, uh, the, the next part. So we're going to do some role play. We're going to be breaking up into three groups. We're going to be answering the following questions in our next assignment. Right. The key that we try to emphasize over and over and over again is that when we do analytics, we are not doing it for the sake of analytics. We have a specific question or set of questions in mind. Okay? So we want you to express what those are. Okay? 
once you've covered this, this will take some time, right? We want you to answer these other questions, okay? How do you get data for it? Maybe it doesn't come from big data. Maybe it doesn't even come from the learning management system, okay? But if it does, then let's think about it some more. How would you implement it, okay? And as we said before, we want the <coughs> actions to be, uh, sorry, the outcomes to be actionable. We have to close that cycle. We have to make sure that something good can come out of those analytics. Okay? It's not just for uh, performance appraisal and things like that. Okay, It has to affect the learner in a positive way. Okay? And how do we make it sustainable? This is a, sort of like a more longitudinal question. When you bring in previous year's cohort data and other things of this sort, how do you do that? Yes, yeah, time for the uh, I think it's under uh, 12 days. Okay, so do you want to just uh, just uh, walk us through the okay? Yeah, so then we'll do that. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I'll try to take you through these and then maybe we can have a, just a group discussion on yeah, the other one. Um, all right, so let, let me go back to this slide. Sorry about that. So uh, I'd like us to think uh, in these six different roles, okay? So I'll just uh, give you a number, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I'm just going to call out numbers for each person. So starting from the back row, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, and then the second row, three, four, five, six, one, one, two, three, four, Five, five, yes. Six. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, then the second to last row. One, two, three, four, five, six. Five, six, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, that's nice. Yes, five. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is help us structure what you think about these six things, uh, these six stakeholders for the questions that we have. Okay, so I'm going to take notes while we do it all together jointly. How's that? Okay. Yeah, okay. It's okay. I'll, I'll do it on the top. <laughs> okay, so uh, Alex is going to describe for us, I think, because I see him on the top. Okay, so um, let's think about those six stakeholders. What, what types of questions do we think we want? You can think about any of the disciplines that you have. This one was supposed to be for math, right? But uh, I'd like to just generalize it out from your various perspectives, given that you're coming from different uh, So let's start with the first stakeholder, which was, I think, uh, the learners. Yes. Okay. How can I do better? Okay. What do I know or what do I not know? So how, how can we make that more specific? Because when we think about that within the context of a discipline, then it becomes much more personalized and understanding. Can you envision it for a specific discipline or a specific unit of year? Yeah. Yeah, so we have to pick one. Let's uh, take English one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
take my sanji, okay? I'll nominate my son E3, okay? So uh, can we think about the types of activities that a learner would want to do? Are, are they well enough established that they can think about what type of learning objectives they need at E3? Some. Some maybe, yeah. But how, how would you want to, to give them something to, to work on? Would it be relevant for them to get information from the LMS? Or would you want it digested by the teacher, for example? So how would you how would you make these statements into something that would make sense for a, a, a P3 mother tongue or English instructor or student, right? <coughs> I think at P3, I think the teacher probably needs to do a lot more coaching uh, and maybe not um, explaining to the students perhaps, but, uh, but they can then have the activity they have online. Yeah. And, um, so, how would you break this down more? Yes, you want to start to specialize it and ask specific questions which you want to answer. What would a child know or look for? Am I able to recognize the individual letters? Okay. I need to recognize the individual letters so that I can also what I am able to do. So, we would like to know whether the child is able to uh, read and understand maybe a simple sentence. And then after that, uh, you know, understand. Specific characters are yeah. yes. yes. Okay, so recognition versus production, for yes. example. Okay, so maybe I have that as a specific problem. What type of uh, way could I go about doing this problem? Then? If I want to ask this question, what type of data would I want to collect to know this? Would I expose them to lots of reading exercises? Would I want to do uh, MCQs with them? Uh, how would you want to make this activity? Okay, sure, would be the words, right? Yeah. Words, yeah. Words, yeah. Words, yeah. Which of the words the kids okay. Is there a second step? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Let's say if I want to know whether the child knows what the sentence means, then I can have a picture of a particular person showing the activity and then a few. Uh, just a few statements, the child will be able to link what this sentence means. Then I would know as a teacher or you know, would expect the right yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I can uh, give them a multimodal uh, picture or, or a video to watch and then put them to match a statement. Okay, yeah, that's one activity. Is there more than one way we can get at this data? Because sometimes we, we, we don't want just one method of assessment. Right? Sometimes having multiple ways of assessing is a good way to facilitate. Right? Maybe they can read a text. Yeah. So, so complete a sentence or read a text. So we, we might be able to use all these uh, pieces of information to triangulate from them. Right? Rather than just saying, okay, I just give you a direct assessment. Right? I also want implicit assessment. Right, which is you do another activity, and somehow by doing that activity, it forces you to do another skill, right? And through that other activity about the, either the time you take to do it or whether you do it correctly or not, I can get you know, a correlated assessment to the direct activity, right? What other tricks? This is good. Or, or maybe we can think about the other stakeholders. So we're just talking here specific about the learner. But we said P3 students, maybe they're not at the point where we can give them specific feedback. It has to be interpreted to the teacher. What, as a P3 teacher, what type of information would you want that complements what you already know? Okay, like, again, as a teacher, we are interact with our students every day. We know they're... Uh, temperament, we know what mastery they have, but there's certain things which we, we just simply don't have enough time or data for. And so what can the analytics perhaps tell you about them? 
Tell me how long the child took to, to respond to the question. Okay, great. Sometimes we, we don't know how long they take to do an exercise, especially in SLS. We may not know the amount of time the students are spending on an exercise, right? So there we may need to use some type of uh, behavioral detection to see whether they're actually engaged on activity or not, right? Maybe we'll show you before they get the right one. Mm -hmm. So how many uh, tries did it take it to, to accomplish the task? How certain would be the choice? But I know that SLS does not ask you to get But maybe two, I don't know whether two can make it four. So how can we decide certainty? You know, when the student answers a certain thing, how do you know whether they're the student can certain uh, indicate how sure they are? They are. Mm -hmm. okay. So you can self-report, self-report, right? And we can also do some normalization here. We can say, okay, you, can you are actually not. Hmm? The child with passion on coming back to the question. Yes, okay. And there's a lot of cases where uh, instructions of uh, instructional media on SLS or other electronic platforms allow you to revisit without penalty. That's the best thing, right? You can do mastery learning this way <coughs> by not worrying about whether it's being assessed or not, right? So we also want to take that into consideration. We can also look at their confidence, right? Their self-reported confidence. But let's say I'm always very timid. I'm always not sure. But actually, I get all the exercises, right? Mm -hmm. right? Then we can normalize that as well when we give them feedback. We can say, great job. You may not be confident, but actually, you know the subject material very well. OK? That can be a, 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 another reinforcement. It's still challenging. Yeah, so we can think about what is most challenging for them to understand. How do they voice that out? Many times at P3, they won't know it explicitly tell you. They just say, oh, this is extremely difficult, right? So this is where the automatic assessment can help, right? Because we can say, as a curriculum designer, I'm designing these particular exercises to fit different words or different characteristics of the recognition base, right? So I can say that certain units are harder than others. Right? Yes. Can you elaborate more? So, uh, in, in trying to learn something, uh, the, 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 the many students, so different students actually respond to different, different uh, uh, views. And so, some students need more than others in terms of step. So, a teacher might want to be able to give, to, to know, to assess, and then to give the right. Right, exactly. So sometimes we also want our systems to help with that. Okay, just like the adaptive method that I showed you earlier, right? If the system can suggest, I think this student is challenged in this way, therefore I think the following exercises would be helpful, then it becomes under the uh, under the importance of the teacher to direct whether that is the appropriate strategy or not. So again, the teacher in the group is very important, right? So the system can suggest, but then the teacher has to be there with the student to say whether well, that's correct, right? Otherwise, what happens is when things are completely automated, then the teacher also loses touch that the student is doing in the SLS. That can be very dangerous, right? Because we have two things that are never going to meet again. Those people who we saw who are the fringe learners become even more fringe, right? They need to be less connected to you as in the classroom. So uh, different scaffolds could mean that different exercises are difficult. It could mean uh, different levels of mastery within your cohort. Okay. Now we have the capability. If we aggregate, for example, in subject banding, all the students in Singapore attempting a certain thing, then it becomes better to have amortized costs for development. Right? You can say, okay, all the students at P3, mother tongue, maybe uh, Chinese or Tamil are doing this exercise. Then I can start to say, okay, it's worthwhile for me to get several master teams <coughs> together, construct several different prompts based on this, analyze the students who are all going through this subject together, and then think about how to uh, segregate them in such a way that I can help them. Right. Maybe it's, it would be good to know so what kind of uh, exercise the students are <coughs> inclined to try. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's some. It, it might show us whether they engage in doing certain type of exercises. So this will help us better understand 
how each of the students is, you know, in trying to explore, how, you know, whether do we really enjoy doing that kind of particular form of uh, exercise? What what is it that we really like? Yes, yes. So we want to uh, explore, just like we had in the other case, right, with the <coughs> student prompts. Right? We may decide that we want to have public exercises a little bit more, but as we get a larger spectrum of uh, exercises to do, still feel all of them, but maybe with uh, certain learners or certain communities to find which ones are the most appropriate ones to do. Right. Okay, let's go uh, to, uh, <coughs> maybe we can go to uh, six for how would you implement <coughs> Yeah, I have to go down, sorry. So uh, let's take one of those examples. So we have uh, scaffolding for uh, we are looking at the number of exercises done and the number of incorrect answers that has come through for P3 uh, public health students. What type of data did we want to collect? How would we collect it? Is there any problems of collecting that data? Um, from a privacy perspective, or from an integration perspective, across all schools in Singapore? Is this something that we just leave to the IT designers? Okay, you guys have to go do it. Go figure it out. So, can we consider it from a different learner's perspective? Mm -hmm. or different stakeholders? Okay, so maybe we want to widen it from uh, learning analytics to educational data mining, thinking of the principals, the administrators, other people involved. Actually, one of the challenges is to, to make sure that the uh, uh, data is reliable and more valid um, because that requires uh, a fairly high uh, degree of assessment literacy because the, the officer will be designed the task. Mm. But how would we go about structuring a policy or a way to make that effective? I just uh, have, was thinking about <coughs> scaffolding, right? You know, the kind of uh, uh, exercises or activities that we want to different students do. So um, perhaps for a group of students or a large group of students in a single audience, you might have maybe given them different types of uh, activities yes. or sequences of activities. Right. So what you might need to know beforehand will be some profiles. If you take, a, say, a particular learning outcomes, say a set of learning outcomes, things that they might not know before. So, so these students have a certain profile about what they know how to do. And now they are given different kinds of activities or sequences of activities. What then we need to know will be uh, the kind of outcomes we get, uh, what are their responses, are they achieving what they are supposed to achieve? And that will then inform uh, what kind of activities to be given to different groups of students. If you have a large uh, data set, then you can that's uh, representative. I think that's a really key point, right? We want to involve prior data into our analysis. Otherwise, if we don't know this, we don't know what types of uh, dimensions we can analyze. But that also brings in another issue about how we provision that data. Because, you know, even within NUS, you know, faculties protect their individual students from for privacy reasons, right? So certain school may not want to expose their data to everyone generally, right? So we have to make sure that the right data is being exchanged at the right level, kind of thing. Right? Sometimes we just need summative uh, information, right? Not in individual learner information to 
say this this cohort here is achieving slightly less than another cohort over there. So I just combine that information rather than having an aggregate, sorry, that individual fine grain information. Okay. This comes back to the, again the uh, previous point that we said we need to know what we want to analyze exactly what type of question or action we want as an outcome in order for us to make the decision of what data to get. <coughs> so we're almost out of time, so we'll uh, turn it to the next question, which is how to make the actions out, uh, outcomes actionable. <coughs> as a teacher, what do you need to take the next step after you get this imaginative uh, imaginary report, okay, coming from the uh, learning analytics. What type of information do you want to contain, and how are you going to take that forward? You have to close that cycle. So, the step set activities, basically, so the report can say this group of students making certain things, uh, and that's the most probabilistic uh, <laughs> you know, suggested guy. Mm -hmm. I would like to know whether the kids you know whether they uh, achieve the objective that I have set out for them. And if this data shows me, then I will know which group of students I will need to give more targeted, uh, you know, uh, help uh, versus students who are way, uh, you know, well way above what they expected to. And also, how can I make use of this group of students to deliver? Help those who might be, you know, not even near the expected uh, outcome. Yeah. That's a great point. As a teacher, we are faced with time constraints, right? So we want the analytics to help them benefit, direct their attention to the target <coughs> people that we need to uh, manage the most, right? So the other part of, of your answer was that we want the peers to help each other. So we have to identify the peers that can help scaffold all these interventions, right? Again, when we prep, uh, pair strong students with weak students, everyone benefits. But when we pair weak students with weak students, no one benefits, right? So we have to be very careful about how we do that type of peer interaction. You can also show me whether the pedagogy that I'm using, whether is it helping the students or whether I need to relook at how I can teach you a certain concept or a certain, you know, uh, objective. So that will also inform me as a teacher to <coughs> moving forward what I should do. Exactly. And also another information that can come out of this is how can I then engage the parents to get the parents to work with the kids with this data? You know, so what kind of uh, support the parents can give at home to level up the kids mm -hmm. as well? Right, so involving the larger or wider stakeholders as an actionable outcome, right? How do I message the parents appropriately to get their child to interact more appropriately with these systems? And also, if let's say I know certain behavior of the kids, uh, it's not just very specific to one subject, then actually, I, you know, it's a matter of working with other students to understand, let's say this child has some needs that goes beyond learning. Then there are certain uh, behavioral patterns, you know, uh, that can be gained from this data to see how we can help support that kid. You know? So that uh, kind of thing, information from the data can actually uh, help the teachers support one another, the other teachers as well yes. in helping that child. You know? Yes. So sometimes we want to aggregate data over multiple classes to be able to detect certain behaviors or special challenges or needs. So, uh, yes. Um, I think maybe when we look at this, um, we can leverage uh, patterns that or observations that we really had in the past to identify areas we want to go deeper in. We have a tendency to always be looking at learning businesses and teaching businesses. Uh, on the other hand, actually, learning and analytics, I think, can help us to look at how students learn well, not just how they don't learn well. Or what is the shortfall? So, by understanding how students learn well, then we identify the methods uh, or even how the, the teaching methodologies have gone well. Then you can do need to strengthen some of those areas rather than it's always about three areas and you're trying to drop the gap. Uh, so, so, I suppose there are two sides to, to, to the stories, and 
uh, we tend to focus on the weakness part. So, so we can always see it as learning uh, weaknesses as well as learning strength, teaching weaknesses as well as teaching strength instead of always focusing on weaknesses. Uh, but uh, I would think that data is not always what we what we want to gather now. It's also what we really have uh, patterns and areas of observations. For example, we know that for example in mathematics, many students struggle with with algebra, then what do we want to investigate in algebra? What, if, what is the specific area? You identify the area, then you go into the using <coughs> learning and analytics to go deep, do a deep dive so that you can identify the strength, the weaknesses, and so on so forth. And, and that helps you to devise the strategies and interaction. Uh, so, so that's a bit of something. Yeah, I think it's important to think about the strengths as well as weaknesses and to figure out for each of the different stakeholders, because, for example, gifted and special needs, they have very different uh, uh, acumen and uh, needs, right? So we need to be uh, conscious of that, as well as the regular or longer okay. So I think we're out of time, so I'm just going to do a little bit of wrap-up, and then we'll let everyone go. And we can have time for more questions individually, because that makes more sense. Okay, so uh, today we've gone over, uh, in the first half of our talk, uh, Abelardo went over what is uh, learning analytics and how it's different from several different other uh, areas of Futura. Hopefully these are all clear to you now, right? We also talked a, a, quite a bit about the cycle of learning analytics and the fact that even just closing this loop one time around is already considered learning analytics and very challenging. Right. When you think about integrating longitudinal data or patch data, that becomes even another layer of expertise like, and challenge. Okay, and then the role of the stakeholder with relationship that it's not just top down and bottom up, but that having this um, productive tension, as I think he says, between the commons is very important. So that uh, everyone has a role and no one feels that they're, they're having ownership directly. Okay. Uh, we talked about several modalities and case studies where uh, Alex and I went over uh, in a few different areas. And uh, we've all together done a uh, uh, case study for ourselves. Okay. So um, that's all we have for you today. I hope it was a productive